Wildlife by Cynthia de Felice, Chapter 16 Eric slept fitfully, visited by strange, disjointed dreams. In one, his parents were being pursued by faceless bad guys in a strange land. In another, he raced about the prairie on four legs like Quill, amazed by his, speed, his own speed and agility. In the last, his grandmother, frantic with worry about him, had called Mr. Poole, his elementary school principal, to track him down. As Mr. Poole closed in on his hiding place, Eric became so anxious he felt sick. So very, very sick. He woke then, clutching his stomach. A painful cramp seized him, followed by another. He leaped to his feet and managed to walk a few steps before becoming ill. Sinking to his knees, he spewed the contents of his stomach onto the ground in a series of violent spasms. Lifting his head shakily, he felt the cramps move lower and knew with dread that his illness was not going to be limited to vomiting. Hours passed during which Eric was racked by fever and sickness. Finally, spent and exhausted, he lay face up on his sleeping bag. Chills kept alternating with drenching sweats, and now he felt he was burning up. He gazed into Quill's uncomprehending face and wondered if he was dreaming again. Who was this creature who had been by his side all morning, staring at him with what had felt like concern and confusion? When he came to his senses enough to remember that this was Quill, that she was his dog, a stab of happiness pierced his misery. He forced himself to sit up. He felt dizzy, hollowed out. Hey, Quill, he said weakly. Quill gave an excited bark and started to run, looking back as if to say, Finally, let's go! Hang on a second, Eric mumbled. He knew Quill had to be hungry and that he, too, needed food, even, the, even though the idea of eating revolted him at the moment. But his mouth, it was too dry. He tried to lick his parched lips, but nothing happened. He needed water. Water. Was it the unboiled water that had made him so sick? Or maybe the parts of the bird that weren't cooked all the way through? He didn't know. Watching Quill, who was merrily stalking a mouse, he envied her for being able to eat pheasant innards and drink contaminated water without so much as a burp. Eric's shoulders sagged. He had been careless, and careless people didn't survive. He wouldn't survive, either, unless he got some food and water. Feeling weary, he got to his feet and started gathering wood. When he had a proper fire going, he filled the pot and waited, stoking the flames from time to time with sticks and grass for it to bubble. He let it boil for several minutes, wishing he knew if there were some kind of rule about how long it took to kill the bugs in there. He waited some more, this time for the water to cool. As he did, he began to feel better, stronger. A stiff breeze had come up from the northwest, bringing much colder air with it, so he put on his warmest clothing. Then he forced himself to drink the water in small, slow sips. When it was gone, he boiled more to fill his canteen, and at last he felt ready to move on. He had recovered enough to feel his hunger return. He guessed the time to be about ten or eleven o'clock. His pack held nothing at all to eat, and Eric had just one thought in mind, finding food. After about an hour of walking, he noticed that Quill was moving quickly, her nose down, tail wagging. Expecting a bird to go up any minute, he was unprepared when a jackrabbit appeared and started racing across the field. Eric didn't think to shoot it until it was too far away. Quill, who approached birds slowly in order to point and hold them, showed no such restraint when it came to the rabbit. She took off after it, giving high-pitched, excited yips that sounded to Eric like a rusty gate swinging back and forth in the wind. He laughed at first, watching the jackrabbit dodge and weave with Quill in hot pursuit. But when Quill had run well over a mile and was out of sight, he became concerned. He followed, calling for her until he grew hoarse. 
fighting down the panic that rose in his chest at the idea of losing her. Mike Duvichin had said she had run off on him. Maybe it had happened just this way. Not knowing what to do, Eric sank down in the grass. He had no chance of finding Quill. She would have to find him. If she wanted to. He couldn't bear to think what he'd do if she didn't. Finally, he saw her, a tiny speck on the horizon moving slowly toward him. Something about her gait looked strange to him. When she approached at last, she was panting heavily. Her tongue was hanging out, her tail was drooping, and she was favoring her right front leg. Any notion of a scolding was forgotten. Eric held her head and rubbed his face along her cheek. Then he lifted her leg and examined it carefully, pressing down the length of it from shoulder to foot, gently bending each joint. Oh, Quill, he said softly, what have you done to yourself? He worked his way back up the leg, and she let out a little whine when he reached the joint below her shoulder. There was nothing obvious there, no cut, no bleeding, no sharp thorn. Eric figured she must have strained or torn a muscle and hoped it wasn't too serious. He emptied half the water from the canteen and watched as she lapped it all up. Then she lay down in the grass, tongue dripping, still panting. Eric took a small sip of water and sat beside her to wait for her to cool down. After a while, Quill got up and looked around, her nose twitching. She looked at Eric as if to say, I'm ready. You? And she began trotting across the field. She limped slightly with every step, but didn't appear to take any notice of it. Eric admired her spirit, but at the same time he worried about her. What would happen if she became too lame to walk, to hunt? They would starve for sure. He imagined how good that rabbit would have tasted and promised himself he'd be ready to shoot whatever Quill found, whether it flew, ran, climbed a tree, or slithered on the ground. He paused for a moment, wondering if he was hungry enough to eat a snake. The answer was yes. Yep, he sure was. He was pretty sure he remembered somebody saying it tasted like chicken, but everyone had laughed afterwards, so he wasn't sure if that was true or not. By late afternoon, Eric had drunk all his water and missed two roosters. In desperation, he took a shot at a hen. It came down, and Quill retrieved it. Guiltily, Eric field-dressed it and put it into his pack. It was time to start looking for a place to stop for the night. Quill's leg seemed to have recovered, but he didn't want to push her any farther than he had to. Ahead, Eric could see some buildings. The temptation of finding easy water from a spigot, as he had before, drew him closer. He leashed Quill, and they sneaked forward a few steps at a time, taking cover where they could, ready to drop to the ground at the first sign of a person. There was a farmhouse at the end of a long driveway, but it had a deserted look about it. The roof was caved in on one side, and the porch was falling off. As he drew near, he saw that several of the windows were broken. There were two cars up on blocks and a rusty truck with the hood raised. Eric had the feeling it had been that way for a long time. All the left-behind, empty houses he'd seen in town had depressed him. But now he was grateful for the way people out here seemed to just up and go, leaving a house to fall slowly to ruin. He couldn't help wondering what made them do it. And what had brought them out here in the first place? From behind a poplar tree, he got a good look at the yard. There was a barn, an empty corn crib, and a smaller building that could have been a shed or a workshop. He peeked in the barn and then in the shed and saw no sign of people or a source of water. He was about to run away when his eye caught on something sitting on top of the workbench. It was the familiar brightly colored wrapper of a bag of Doritos. Mem mesmerized by the sight, Eric opened the door and went inside, telling himself not to get his hopes up, that the bag was surely empty, but it was full and unopened, and beside it was a liter of used paper cups, paper, a litter of used paper coffee cups and crumpled wrappers, and there was a bag of small, a small bag of peanuts and a Snickers bar. Next to that were two cans of Mountain Dew, still attached to the plastic rings that had once held a six-pack. The packages contained the food that had been, nibble, had been nibbled on, probably by mice. The soda cans were covered in a fine layer of dust. All of it sat on the workbench, 
trapped amid a tangle of old spider webs and dead flies. It was beautiful. Eric stared at this unexpected bounty, his mouth watering as he imagined the salty taste of the peanuts and chips, followed by the sweetness of the candy. He grabbed the chip bag and held it up so Quill, who was sniffing around in the corner, could see it. And he ripped it open, stuffed a handful into his mouth, and held out another handful for Quill. The flood of flavor in his mouth was delicious. He continued eating, one handful for him, one for Quill, followed by a sip of soda until the bag was empty. The peanuts he shared with Quill, but not the candy bar. As he unhooked her leash, he explained to her that he wasn't being selfish. It was just that he remembered Patrick and Mr. Holt talking about the time Hot Spots ate an entire chocolate cake and nearly died. Eric didn't know if the coating on a candy bar was enough chocolate to make a dog sick, but he wasn't taking any chances. Besides, he told her several times during the day, he had noticed her chewing on things she had come across in her travels. Grass, bones, dead animals, and, he suspected, rabbit poop. He, can com he comforted himself with the thought that she had a lot more in her stomach than he did. As they trudged on, Eric realized that he had just helped himself to someone else's property without thinking twice about it. Earlier in the day, he'd shot a hen pheasant, something no respectable hunter would do. In the space of a single afternoon, it seemed, he'd embarked on a career in crime, going from being a mere liar and runaway to poacher, trespasser, and now thief. A small voice inside reminded him that he had become a thief when he ran off with Quill. She didn't really belong to him even if her owner didn't deserve her. Doubts about what he was doing crowded his thoughts. Was he really living off the land if he was eating Doritos and slugging down Mountain Dew? Did the fact that he was trying to survive make it okay to do things he knew were wrong? These thoughts made him uncomfortable, and he tried to put them out of his mind. When he saw the straight line of a road about a quarter mile ahead, he put his hand on Quill's collar to control her. They approached slowly and carefully. A car appeared in the far distance, a plume of dust following its path. They hid in some bushes to wait for it to pass. Eric hunkered down as low as he could, pulling Quill down with him. Peering through the leaves of the bush had concealed them. He saw that the vehicle was a sheriff's patrol car. Traveling very slowly, was the driver on the lookout for a lost kid and dog? Eric's heart started beating fast. They were well hidden, weren't they? To his relief, the car continued to creep down the road and finally disappeared from sight. He wondered if it really had been looking for him, and if so, how many others were searching. There was no way to know. He and Quill had been careful, but they were going to have to be extra vigilant from here on out. About an hour later, he staggered over a rise to see Quill wading chest-deep in a pothole, slurping away. Oblivious to the mud, her feet stirred up. Quickly, Eric ran to the far side, where the water was undisturbed, and held the pot under the surface. As it filled, he thought about the eternity it would take to make a fire, get the water to boil, and wait for it to cool down afterwards. They were well out of sight of any roads. This was a good place to camp. He cleaned the hen pheasant, surprised by how much smaller it was than a male, then made a fire and started the bird roasting and the water simmering. The wind started to blow much more strongly in sudden gusts that caused the smoke from the fire to swirl unpredictably. Eric's eyes were stinging and it was dark by the time the bird was cooked. He tried to eat slowly to savor the rich flavor, but the meat was soon gone and once again he was left feeling hungry. As Quill crunched the bones, Eric lay on his back and listened and watched. The wind blew even harder, bringing in clouds that obscured the stars. It howled and roared louder than the noises of the night, the night animals, and sounding at times like a wild creature itself. Eric got up and put on his warm jacket, then snuggled into his sleeping bag beside Quill, feeling proud. Despite everything, they had made it for three whole days. Stay tuned next time for chapter 17.